Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, subscribe, share, and support. You may subscribe wherever you find this, be it YouTube, Anchor, Transistor, Apple, Google, Spotify, etc. Share by sharing the very words of God that you hear read aloud or recited by me, and support by signing up for the newsletter, oxum.substack.com, or, and heading over to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. Today, we are entering that great theological, polemical text known by many as Revelations, but actually Revelation, or in the Orthodox Church, St. John or Holy John's Revelation, or the Apocalypse. There's a lot of fantastical information in this book, and so people get carried away. I hope to give a more grounded understanding of this. First, and most simply, Apocalypse is not necessarily everything blowing up like a Michael Bay movie, but it means simply, as the name states, to reveal or to uncover. Hence, Revelation, or John's Revelation. The Greek church is very interesting regarding this book and regarding biblical canon writ large because they do not have it in their liturgical rubric, but they did later on accept it to the point where one of the most famous preachers in the Greek language, who is really of Antioch, and I think the Syrian desert gets to claim him, but he was a, a city boy, the great St. John Chrysostom or John the Golden Mouth did not accept this book as scripture. That's fascinating. Continuing on the greater idea of the Syrian desert, the Syriac Orthodox Church, of which I am in communion with, does not accept this book as scripture, uh, along with Jude, Second Peter, and Second John, and Third John. What's interesting about that is while most people in the scholarly field believe that the New Testament was written in Greek, there are a minority of people who believe that it's possible at least some of the New Testament was written fully in Aramaic. For sure, the Greek uh, manuscripts themselves have portions which are in Aramaic, and for sure those people were Aramaic speakers. So it's just a matter of... Um, you know, what was the original? And right now, the kind of manuscripts we have go back to the fourth and fifth centuries or the 300s and the 400s. And the Greek manuscripts are older. But again, those Greek manuscripts have Aramaic and Syriac is the literary form of Aramaic. But I am of the Gezrite. And the Gezrite is the most liberal of biblical canons, although maybe conservative in other aspects. In canon, we are very, very liberal. Within our liturgical rubric, the regular readings include revelation for the associate deacon. Uh, those are the non-Pauline readings read by the number two deacon. And also on Pascha or Easter or the resurrection, we read John's revelation in its entirety. It's really incredible. If you've never seen it, go to Pascha one time in an Ethiopian church and you will, if they are traditional, hear all of Revelation, all 22 chapters. So anyway, you'll hear about the island called Patmos where John is said to have written this text. And the big idea I want you to take over is that the context is the period of martyrs where the Christians are putting, uh, getting put to death by the state. They're getting executed every day with bread and circuses. Uh, they're getting fed to lions. They're getting, I mean, slaughtered in, in so many different ways. And so the church is suffering. And through that suffering, John is trying to impart courage. John is trying to impart hope unto these people that at a date that is soon, although unknown, the Lord will come to judge all those who've ever lived and all those who've ever dead, uh, died. And on that occasion, they will be vindicated. That is those Christians, those martyrs who are able to hope through suffering. Let's get into the text itself. Verses one to three. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. I'm reading today from the NKJV, that is the New King James Version. And as we often do in this Ephesus School Network of podcast, we will point out that when you hear servant, you should hear slaves. And when you hear angel, you should hear messenger. Remember the functionality of these positions. And then you should realize that when you hear witness, you should hear the word martyr because the martyrs are those who give witness. It's the same word in the Greek. And realize that banishment is a form of martyrdom, although it's not equal to actually losing your life. It is a, a minor form. There are degrees of martyrdom or giving witness. In the uh, official church, when you are threatened with death and you do not fold, you do not give in to that fear of death, but you're not actually put to death, you're called a confessor. So we know there's a, a, a martyr who's put to death, a martyr who's a confessor, there could be a, a martyr who is banished, and there are varying degrees of sufferings, all of which in the first century for Christians are far worse than anything we have in the United States in the 21st century. So we can humble ourselves by the real church history in the first century, but also of, of the Russians in the 20th century who were subject to communist regimes. So when you see the word of God, remember that the logos here is not the logos of uh, Platonism or Neoplatonism, but the word of God, the Dabar Yahweh, is a re an instruction unto repentance, an instruction so that you turn your head 180 degrees and face God. You do that by having a person read aloud the prophecy and then you hear that prophecy and then you do that prophecy you protect that prophecy you keep that prophecy verses four to eight john to the seven churches which are in asia grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So this was, is, and is to come, this past, present, and future is repeated. We know that in Semitic tongues, repetition is a form of emphasis in a culture that does not have emojis or capital letters, caps lock, to show that they really mean what they say. Repetition and synonymic parallelism is the way that emphasis is shown. Here we have an example of repetition. And although it is a, a Greek language, as I said, there is certainly Aramaic influence and the greater Hebrew is always behind the New Testament text because that is the Older Testament. So holiness is the idea here. Holiness is being set apart, being taboo, being distinct from the universe, from the cosmos, from space, time itself, because he is the author of the heavens and the earth. He is separate and distinct from them and ruling over them. His kingship is not like the kingship of the kings of the earth, but he is king over them 
and he's also the faithful witness, that is to say, the faithful martyr, the firstborn. He's not somebody who just sits on his high horse and tells us what to do, but he goes and he is the vanguard. He is in the front row. He is the fodder for the enemy. We also have here spirits, which are before the throne. Recall the divine council that uses the royal we in Genesis 1.26. Let us create man or humankind or Adam, the groundling, in our image and in our likeness. Genesis 11.7. Let us come down and confuse them. Let us scatter them. 1 Kings 22. Verses 21 and 22. I will entice him, says one of the spirits before the throne of God. Let me be a lying spirit in the mouths of his prophets. All of this is to remind you that God means business. He's distinct from the heavens and the earth because he wrote the heavens and the earth. He has spirits before his awesome throne. And all of this is foreshadowing the coming judgment. And if there is judgment, and if those who lived in accordance with this front-running firstborn from among the dead, the real king over all the kings of the earth, who is a faithful martyr, if there's going to be vindication, then there is hope. And you should continue doing what you're doing, which is reading the word of God, hearing the word of God and keeping, doing, protecting the word of God. Verses 9 to the end. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, of course, there's a lot of uh, numerology here. We know throughout the Bible that seven is the number of perfection. I'm no expert on numerology, so that's probably as far into that as I'll go, although I will say that in Hebrews, the two-edged or double-edged sword is a mashal or is a masali, is an illustration for the word of God, for the teaching of the Lord. And in the Johnine literature writ large, which we've already gone through on this podcast, what's fascinating is that John refers to the people he's speaking to as his children, that is to say his disciples, his spiritual children that he's given birth to. Yet here in his revelation, he now stands as a brother. And I think this shift here 
is because of this repeated foreboding and foreshadowing judgment that is coming on. And the great call from Jesus, who's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, is to not be afraid. He says, do not fear death. Do not fear Hades. Do not fear Sheol. Do not fear the place of the dead. The number one tool of tyrants like Nero, who we'll get into later when we get into the highly debated 666 topic, but not really debated among scholars, I don't think, at least not the rigorous ones. So the number one tool of tyrants is to bend the will of the people to change their behavior through their fear of death, through their fear of Hades, through their fear of Sheol, through their fear of the place of the dead. The submersive life-giving message of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ makes this bending of the will by tyrants topsy-turvy. It flips it on its head. Is it is a counter ideology. He bends it back 180 degrees, just like the repentance we spoke of earlier, so that we can face God. He emasculates the tyrants. He deflates their power. He overshadows them. He overpowers them. He overcomes them. He conquers them because they are temporary, but he is the first and the last. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever.